Now, quotation marks. Over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, so, yeah, thank you all for being here. Um, and um, thank you to two of my um, co co-authors for also being here who uh, will, um, will, will help me answer the questions, but I'm just going to uh, sort of rattle it off. Um, so this, uh, this really is a story of um, what, what I've been up to um, quite recently um, in the last few months of my uh, previous role at Birkbeck, um, and, um, and in a way also the story of what I've been up to the whole time over the last 10 years that I've been working at Birkbeck. Um, so uh, it could only really be down to me to present this, I suppose. Um, and uh, so it's a story of a, of a review, a review of technology-enhanced learning. Uh, that we that we did in the college, um, and it's still a bit of an unfinished tale, um, I must warn you, and a bit of a trip down memory lane. Um, it began with an institution-wide student experience review, um, and various findings were pointing the need, pointing to the need to increase support for digital approaches to learning and teaching. And to make a long story short enough, this resulted in uh, doing a tail review to look into what we are doing, what other institutions are doing, what we think we should be doing. And so as in so many of these kinds of stories, the context is king. Um, so what, uh, I should tell you a bit about the context of the institution, which is Birkbeck uh, University of London. So Berkeley was actually established in 1823, then as the London Mechanics Institute, um, by somebody called Dr. George Birkbeck. So that was the, where the name actually came from. Um, for the purpose, the express purpose, of enabling working people to study in the evening, um, which was also known at the time, or referred to, um, as spreading the seeds of evil. Um, and the same mission continues today. Um, so really, of enabling working people to study in the evening. And so, uh, so really, who are, uh, who are our students at Birkbeck? There is really no uh, typical Birkbeck student. Um, overwhelmingly, uh, for the most part, everyone is evening taught between 6 and 9 p.m., um, studying across uh, all levels from, uh, from certificates of higher education through to uh, doctorates um, across um, many and varied disciplines. The majority traditionally have been part-time students who have entered by a direct application to the college. Um, but increasingly, and with an average age in their kind of mid-30s, but increasingly we've been seeing uh, the um, more uh, people coming in through UCAS, um, the um, average age getting younger, um, more students actually studying full-time while still in the, in the evening, so actually working, sometimes even working full-time and studying full-time. Um, we have a lot of uh, non-traditional students in the sense that they're mature working, it's their first degree, possibly first person in their family to go to university. Um, also, higher than average uh, rates of students from throughout the EU, students with disabilities and specific learning difficulties, and also higher than average numbers of taught postgraduates. So it's quite a, 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 a mix, um, quite a lot of, of contrasts. So doing the tell support in a small, or what I like to call a small to medium face-to-face um, -face university um, of, this, of this kind of um, unusual and quite specific nature is quite a challenge. And we were doing this with quite a small uh, team. So the tell team in 2008 when I joined, um, before I joined, consisted of one learning technologist and one IT trainer. Um, they're joined by one more learning technologist, which was me, um, in 08, 09, to support the process of migrating from WebCT to Blackboard. Um, the IT trainer role didn't get replaced when the person who was doing it left, um, but there was a, um, a, a decision at the time to um, start rolling out lecture capture, and so a post was created for, um, for the purpose of doing that. So it's been a pretty consistent size throughout that, um, throughout that, that history. Um, considering that, mu much has been achieved. So we had mi the migration uh, to Blackboard, rapid growth in the number of modules that were being, using, using the VLE and using learning technologies. Uh, migration again to Moodle, um, a huge growth in online submission and marking, 
A um, lot of changes being made to the data integration and um, improvements to it. Um, Lecture capture, lynda.com, all of this kind of work that needs to go on to just kind of keep the platforms ticking over and keep services running and may enable the possibility of, uh, of doing some kind of technology enhanced learning um, uh, was, was being done. Um, and at the same time, even some surprising things uh, managed to happen around the edges. Um, so some work on uh, developing um, blended, uh, mostly online provision to support uh, skills development, uh, work on developing resources to support inclusive practices, um, accessibility of learning resources, and also some projects with um, the Bloomsbury Learning Environment, like the assessment and feedback project, which resulted in a book that Sarah and I co-edited on assessment feedback and technology. Uh, so some, some, some great practice was happening, but very much like when, uh, you know, when there was kind of a little bit of extra time to do it because there was not a lot of capacity. And unfortunately, instead of seeing this as um, these were as being proofs of concept of the kind of great stuff that we could do, it seemed like this was kind of enough. So, I mean, was this just a case of don't ask, don't tell? I think what was going on here was that we had various uh, Birkbeck, uh, what I call tell myths in operation, um, which were sort of somewhat born from these ideas of Birkbeck exceptionalism, that as the college is so uniquely different, we simply don't need to do things in the way that other people do them. Um, and so one of these key myths was we're not the open university. Um, so we're, we're the wrong institution to do this kind of work. Um, the academics don't want to do tell. That was another key one. Uh, so we basically, we have the wrong staff for doing that kind of stuff. Or our students are not digital natives. So in other words, we have the wrong students for doing that kind of stuff. So there were all, all these kind of things were, were, were sort of circulated and seemed to support the narrative that we didn't really need to. Uh, there wasn't much demand to go further with this. So it was only really when the student experience review came along and said there, there is actually a need to look at this in more depth that there was an opportunity to talk about how we were going to go beyond business as usual. And so what we decided uh, to do with this review was to do an external strand um, which would pull together some data from uh, surveys like Usiza and Health and some, some sector data that was out there and also that we're going to reach out to contacts in other HEIs. And um, we had hoped at the time that, the, uh, that we were proposing how to do this review to have longer than we were given. There was quite a long time waiting for whether we would have the green light to go ahead and then when it came it was like, yes, great, do it and do it in seven weeks. So, uh, so that, that, that meant that we couldn't actually really do all the things that we might have wanted to do and uh, reaching out to contacts at other HEIs became quite a focused process of looking only at these three. In fact, the initial thought that we had, I don't know if Julie's in here, was reach out to other HEIs, talk to Julie. <laughs> um, Julie Vos, uh, who's the head of educational technology at City, because she's also a researcher in how institutions support technology enhanced learning as well. And, um, and it was Julie who recommended that we talk to Sussex, and that proved to be quite useful because it was more of a similar sized kind of institution to Birkbeck with a similar kind of problem of not having really had a lot of resourcing in this area and that had, had built up a, um, a team uh, over time and was now uh, seeing a lot more success with it. So for the internal strand, um, we had intended to do uh, more things than we managed to do. So we wanted interviews with staff, um, surveys of staff and students, user testing of staff and students, focus groups and usage data, but it, it, we, we, we cut some of those things um, and stuck to what we thought we could, we could uh, get done in the time available. Also user testing actually proved to be quite complicated to work out exactly what were we going to test and we think that, that would be something that would need some more thought further down the line. So in terms of the external strand, uh, Immediately, it was clear that these, for, for, for those of us in this kind of alt community, I don't think this is going to be uh, all that surprising, or a lot of our findings are not that surprising, but it kind of needed to come out through an official process. So uh, we, we uh, found that we were already using the most sort of standard or most popular platforms. 
Uh, so it was unlikely that there was a, a fundamental kind of technology lack that we needed to fill with some kind of other tool um, or that would be a, a fix um, to the issues. And, um, and also, um, you size the um, surveys point out that the availability of tele support staff is the largest driver of adoption of learning technologies, um, which is uh, not that surprising, but uh, still some people apparently find it surprising. Um, so, uh, in terms of speaking to people at other institutions, our external strand um, wanted to ask questions about their tell vision, strategy and policy, their governance, um, how they do development and innovation, what kind of team structure and roles they have, and also anything, you know, that we hadn't thought to ask but that they regarded as, you know, the good, the bad and the ugly, uh, things that, things that are just simply, you know, that they need to change or that are on the horizon. Um, or just really great that we had not elucidated. Um, and so what sort of things did we find out? Sorry, these finding slides are a little bit uh, text heavy. Um, I just, I need some water if I'm going to continue. <laughs> So a really key finding here was that across the sector, face-to-face -face teaching is, is actually a bit of a misnomer in the sense that you might have face-to-face uh, um, -face classes, but that teaching is generally regarded as, as, as blended for the most part now. Um, there's, there's always some kind of um, use of technologies, you know, tools, platforms, and services that are involved in even in uh, sort of campus-based, classroom-based um, teaching uh, kind of mode. And, um, and that this understanding is now forming, um, really forming part of institutional strategy and, um, and key processes. Um, and so it's feeding into things like um, quality assurance and um, assessment policy and that kind of thing. Um, education te uh, technology is a fast moving field as well um, where uh, things need to be uh, reviewed and updated. Um, and institutions often have a governance structure which oversees the links between the TEL strategy and its implementation something that we lack. Um, so uh, a key overall finding, of course, there is no magic formula. Um, otherwise, uh, we, we probably all would know it by now. Um, everywhere is kind of different and the structures have evolved organically and responded to the local priorities. But there is a tendency to separate staff from student support, um, to separate pedagogic and technical support. Um, and have dedicated support for distance learning, all of which we felt were worthwhile lessons for <laughs> Brobeck. So, um, so those were um, useful findings. In terms of the internal strand, um, we found learning technologies are being used across all the departments. Um, the top 20 most visited Moodle modules were spread across nine. Uh, students appreciate um, having um, online resources and study materials. Um, they uh, love when you use video, but high production values are not really required. Uh, very um, consistent with, uh, with, with other findings, but this is what the voice of our, our students. They said as, as it's, we want the content that's relevant, timely, and authentic. And uh, staff actually uh, did not agree with the myths, fundamentally. They said uh, we need a culture shift. We need um, strategy and governance of this that feeds directly into policy and investment decisions. Uh, most staff were okay with the idea of standardization, having some kind of baseline or templates or um, you know, uh, evidenced guidance that then would be implemented locally in line with, with their needs. Um, they noted the lack of support in making small modest improvements is a significant break on considering innovations. And uh, staff and students regard our face-to-face -face mode learning and teaching as in fact blended to various varying degrees of intensity. So very much, we are actually uh, pretty much normal <laughs> um, compared with what's going on around the sector um, and not an exceptional land of nothing digital after all. Um, and the main uh, recommendations emerging, and there were various uh, sub-points sub here, but just the headlines are that we would need to develop a digital education strategy, establish a governance structure, build a digital education service, and, um, and then there, there'll be a few other key actions. So what's the, uh, what's the result? Um, well, obviously I'd hoped when doing the abstract to have very much more uh, finalized kind of results to report. 
Um, but as we know, institutional wheels sometimes are slower to turn than, um, than we had hoped. Um, also, uh, there, there was a, um, a financial situation because uh, the college has been hit by the sector-wide slump in part-time study. And while we are seeing conversion of students into, into full-time students, um, it, it, there, there is still a bit of a, of a financial squeeze. And so we feel that our review was very well reviewed and has done significant work to dispel some of the um, tell myths and indicated a way forward for uh, digital education at Birkbeck. But in this context of resource scarcity, will those at the helm um, wonder uh, if they can afford to invest? Um, on the other hand, can they afford not to? And that's it, thank you. <laughs> Thank so. you, Leo, and perfect timing, right <laughs> on the 15-minute mark. Uh, I practiced it so many times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, do we first of all ask, is there any questions in the room with their hands up? Questions? Well, there is a question there for you to uh, go on the uh, Me Too. There is a question there, and it's kind of what I was, I guess what I was talking about in the final um, point. Um, I mean, I think it has moved things forward in the, um, in the institution, sorry, maybe I should repeat the question, I'm not sure if that's necessary. Has producing this data helped to move things forward within the institution and gain support for senior management? So yes, I mean, I think to some degree, yes. I felt that when we presented the findings that, that, that uh, people felt that they were very reasonable and very, uh, very logical, uh, there wasn't really a lot of resistance to it. Um, the, on the other hand, to actually gain implementation of the recommendations is another whole kind of layer of um, uh, kind of arguing over over resources um, and, and um, priorities and that's um, something that um, no I'm not going to be there to be doing but um, do you have any thoughts on, on that part <laughs> Elizabeth one of the co presenters <laughs> Um, the wheels do turn very slowly, but I am certainly having sort of been right in right at the beginning, will continue to push for this. So I am already drafting my next email to the master of the college <laughs> on a follow up because he's the one who gave me um, the go ahead to set up the steering committees in the first place. So I shall follow on and say what a wonderful experience it was and where are we going with it. So I will be pushing on that. So that's gonna cool. Are there any other questions in the room uh, with the roving mic running around? Any? Well, I'll ask one if that's okay with you. Please, please. Um, so, what I found really interesting is the, the, the notion of how you explored blended. Because one of the sort of critical problems you often have in these sort of circumstances is the, this kind of dichotomous thing. Mm. Well, you know, oh, you want me to do technology? then I'm going to have to not teach, I'm going to be replaced by robots and all the kind of stuff. How did, how did you sort of, um, sort of contextualise that, that, that um, spectrum of blended? Well, so this, this was very, uh, in the, way, the way that I've talked about it now was very kind of summarised from a lot of uh, actual kind of more granular feedback from um, focus groups and, and, and interviews with staff and that kind of thing. Uh, but what we, what, what we found was that nobody thought that technology isn't in use already um, and, um, and that they, that they, they actually uh, highlight the fact that it's in, they're using it in the classroom as well. So even in the face-to-face -face moment, they're, uh, you know, they're projecting, they might be showing video or trying to play audio and they, they did mention that sometimes these experiences are not totally reliable and then this makes you wonder if, what, if you should try other things um, and that so you know so it's um you know it, there was really a, a strong feeling that um, that that blendedness is actually quite normal but the sort of extent of it is really a, a continuum and um, and that that it wasn't it wasn't really something that we we asked people to um, reflect on that much so much as just uh, you know more sort of what are you what are you actually doing yeah Cool. Yeah, we've got one follow-up question here. 
Thank you. Thanks very much, Leo and Elizabeth and all. Um, I know that open education is practical and research interest of yours, Leo, so I'm just wondering over the course of those interviews if um, open practices emerged as part of your discussion around town and working beyond the LE um, and, and how that might have emerged. So. Uh, the Open, uh, open practices have emerged uh, now, now and then mu much more actually in um, uh, kind of over, over time that I've been there talking to, to different people about the kind of, uh, the kind of stuff that they do. It, very much I find that they are, they are reflected in things like when the college gives um, awards for teaching. Um, it's very much in relation to some kind of digital and open practice that they're engaged in. But one of the, 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 the curious things um, that I find about Birkbeck as, as an organization is that it doesn't generally address the idea of openness very uh, kind of directly. Um, and so, so as, you know, as I mentioned, one of the, the uh, kind of core tell myths was this one about we're not the open university. And, um, and, and I think that, that this, um, this is quite ironic because, in fact, we, we were the, sort of the, the, the institution most similar to the Open University, um, but simply doing it through kind of a, a different kind of mode. Um, but actually there entirely for the same kind of reasons and with the same type of profile of students. And uh, so that's quite fascinating to me how the, the uh, people who are doing open practices are, are uh, and, unless I've already been uh, kind of on their case about, do you know about all of this, um, wouldn't necessarily call it that. Cool. Well, I'd like everyone to uh, thank Leo and Elizabeth and Sarah <laughs> and all the rest of the uh, presenters for that uh, paper. Thanks.